Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this chat. It is an honor and a privilege to have Tim Sinevi from Barco here. Tim is one of the few people that I have met in 16 years of doing business who I can say he's a thought leader, he's a visionary, he's really trying to change the way people think about technology. And I have gravitated to his vision, I think pretty much since the first day I met him. And Tim, if you could start us off, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and a little bit more about Barco for people who aren't familiar with them. Thank you for having me, Gustavo, and uh, those kind words. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm, I'm blushing. Um, but yeah, so I've been, I've been with Barco for uh, about 12 years now. Um, and I started my career there in professional cinema when we were going through uh, a digitization. So when the industry is moving over from 35 millimeter to, um, to digital. Um, so we started there in a, in a very small business. Uh, and then that conversion, when it picked up steam, went very fast. Uh, and cinema also being one of my passions, that was a great place for me to be. Um, but as we worked through that, it also became obvious to me that you know, the technologies we have as a company, which is primarily centered on visualization technologies and, and tends to be on the ultra high end, some of the most demanding applications that we could use those technologies to do really interesting things in, in what I call the high end residential space as well. Um, and things that go much beyond, uh, let's say home theater, which is kind of one of the traditional focuses of, of the custom integration industry. Um, and for me, it, you know, it allowed me to combine um, a number of the things that I'm interested and passionate uh, about, you know, from movies to, to architecture and design um, and, and everything in between. Um, art, as you can see, which is also one of the great experiences that we can create uh, on, on the digital canvas that we'll be talking about today. So um, I'm very happy to be able to to work on these kinds of things and, and I believe there's a there's a huge opportunity for all of us uh, in, in this space. Fantastic. So let's let's talk. I think the main point, if there's one takeaway that we have from this three part series that I want people to understand is we are trying to show everyone that technology is not about product. It's not even about just experiences. It's, it's a design material. And we are really trying to teach and spread the message that if we start to see technology as another design material, we can create so much more interesting spaces and experiences for people. Would you agree with that, Tim? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I also think, you know, one of the challenges um, is that technology companies are by nature technology companies, right? The kind of people you find in technology companies are, are the kind of people that get really excited about technology, about the technology itself, get really excited about the product. And sometimes as, you know, as a joke, but it's one of those where you go like, it's funny because it's true. Um, I sometimes say that, you know, one, one of our greatest assets as a company is that we have some of the greatest engineers on, on the planet. Right. And one of our biggest weaknesses as a company is that we have some of the greatest engineers on the planet. Um, and I, I guess I was lucky in, in a way. I'm not an engineer, but I've always had a, a, you know, a high interest in technology as such. My, my father was also an engineer, so I guess I, I went against uh, what everybody expected of me. Um, but at the same time, as you know, engineers tend to create these fantastic products, but it's almost from the perspective of if we build it, they will come. Right. If we if we build a fantastic piece of technology, um, that's the value in itself. Um, and, and for some people, it is. Um, and so for me, things started to come together when I looked at uh, entering into this high end residential space and whether it made sense for me, because the first thing I looked at was, OK, there's a number of companies that are active in this space. What is actually the potential of this as a business? Right. And then obviously, you know, it's very easy to go and look at, hey, other companies are playing in these and people are selling projectors and how many projectors is that party selling and how many projectors is, is the other party selling and that is the market. Um, I decided to look at it from the other perspective and say, well, that's not the market, that, that's, that's how we serve the market, right? So 
the first thing is really um, what, what's the oil in the ground, uh, for lack of a better comparison. And I, I looked at it and I said, well, if you're looking at these kinds of high-end applications, then you're looking at at a group of people that you know has this in, has this in their homes and and that can afford these types of solutions, if you will. So I started by looking at, uh, well, really, we're talking about what what people tend to call high net worth individuals, right? So I started by looking at um, people like Credit Suisse, you know, the investment banks, they have a lot of information about uh, wealth in the world and how it's being used. I started looking at people that were looking at uh, luxury housing and those types of things. Um, and, and looking at those are the people that would be our customers or our clients when, when we bring something like this. Um, and then when I put those two numbers together, I had the feeling we're only reaching 5% of the potential here. And, and why is that? Uh, and so long story short, what it came down to for me is it sounds to me like the 5% of people that we are reaching are the 5% of people like ourselves. You know, people that are already interested in technology, people that are already uh, starting to look for technology for technology's sake. So they're basically coming to us. So where are we missing the other 95%? Um, and so, you know, my conclusion in the end there was, well, we're talking about luxury homes. So it's very easy to then get to the architecture and design community. And when you look at it, most of the time, us as an industry, we came into the story much too late, right? We came into the story when the design was uh, already done or when design considerations were already done. Maybe someone wanted a home theater, or maybe someone said, I'm looking at some home automation, so let's get this custom integrator in. Um, but by then, it's way too late. We were never part of, of the creative process. Um, so it was really looking at, OK, if, if architects and designers are the key here, then what is important to an architect and a designer? Um, you know, my conclusion was most architects and designers see technology as a necessary evil. Right, it's something that messes up their design. Now all of a sudden, I have to take this big TV and put it in the living room. Now, no matter how nice the design of a TV is, uh, it doesn't fit into into a, a whole design. Right? Usually, it, it's an eyesore, uh, and when it's not on, it's a big black hole in your design. Um, so that's where a lot of the thinking came from, uh, and basically saying, you know, asking myself the question, okay. How do we turn technology from a necessary evil that architects and designers have to work around? Uh, how do we turn it into a design material, something that they can design with? Um, and then in the process, you know, digital art came to me as this is something we should be looking into. This is a really interesting experience. You know, it's obviously not, uh, not home theater, but there's so much more than home theater. And then, you know, the concept of actually what we are really talking about is a digital canvas uh, was born that way, right? And how do we create that digital canvas so that it actually um, supports the architecture and design community? In fact, they are the ones designing the architectural digital canvas in a way that makes sense for them and to support an experience that they want to include in their design, which could be art, but which could also be, for example, I want to create a virtual window on the world, right? I want to take this wall and I want to turn it into a, a, a digital, I don't like to use the word screen, but I, I, you know, I create the impression that I've pushed over the wall and maybe I'm looking at the forest, right? Which then comes into, into areas like wellness, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which of course, is is a lot of information. Can I, stop, can I stop you real quick and just like let's take a step back? I agree with everything you're saying. I think it's interesting. So let's take a step back and let's talk about the digital canvas. What is it? What you know? We you you gave a great example of how you made those connections and why you made those connections. But what is the most compelling way for architects and designers to think about what is the digital canvas? The best way I can I, I can describe it, I guess it's 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 whatever you want it to be as a as an architect. Uh, you know, in a similar way, where uh, if we if we take art as an example, where it's probably the most natural connection. You know, a painter needs a canvas to paint on, 
right? And that canvas gets created according to the specifications of the painter, taking into account what he wants to create, which means, you know, aspect ratio, size, etc., is all important. Um, so when you start looking at, at uh, digital art, then you need a digital canvas, but the concept is, uh, is, is very similar in that way. It's then quite easy to take it to the next step and say, look, from an architect's and a designer's perspective, you create that canvas, right? The canvas can be the wall, the canvas can be whatever you want it to be, and then the technology is simply a means to an end. So, you know, depending on what it is that you're trying to create, we might use uh, projection, for example, to do that, or we might use uh, direct view LED technology to do that. But what determines it is what you're trying to achieve within your design process. And that's how the technology gets, uh, how the technology gets chosen. So the technology is in service of the architecture and design, not the other way around. Okay, so let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. So your virtual background right now is an example of a home in Atlanta with a digital canvas in, in the main living room area, correct? So correct, yeah. So everything's, everything's hidden, the technology is not visible. What people see as they enter that house is a big, beautiful digital painting in the room. Correct. Okay. Correct. And and this, this was a great example, right? Um, how this came about was, was an integrator that said, look, I'm collaborating with an architect on this home. Uh, it's going to be a show home, so it's going to get a lot of people that will get exposed to this. Um, I, I would like to do something, but currently we're just talking about, uh, you know, doing some home automation, maybe doing some lighting and, and maybe doing a media room or something like that. You know, I, I would like to take you um, I would like to take you to speak to the architect and talk about some ideas of, of what else we could be here, uh, with, what else we could do here, for example, with art. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, the, the integrator kind of warned me, like the architect is a difficult person, right? This is going to be a hard conversation and, you know, don't be surprised if he dismisses you or insults you, <laughs> even. Uh, so I thought, okay, let's, let's go. And so when, when we went there, the house was in wood frame. So, you know, what you see behind me was still in wood frame. Um, but when I was in it, uh, I had a conversation with, with the architect as to what it was going to look like. Um, and very quickly I thought, well, if, if this is going to be, if this is going to be a wall there, we could easily turn this into, uh, into a digital canvas and we could create, we could put art on it. We could even put, uh, you know, what I call window on the world on it. We could put an ocean view on it. We could do, we could do whatever we wanted. Um, and just talking about it from that perspective, as just think of it, we'll, we'll just turn that wall into a, a digital canvas, literally, right? We, we don't have to install a screen. It's not going to change your design or anything like that. And when we switch it off, it's just going to be a wall like you had originally intended. And it was literally in a, in a conversation of three minutes. It, it made complete sense to the architect from that perspective. And he said, let's do it, right? And then when we talked about technology after that, it was simply from the perspective of, okay, what are we gonna use? Are there going to be any limitations? Uh, and at the end of the day, the only limitation was that he had planned to have uh, a, a big down hanging um, lamp in the middle of this space, uh, which, you know, if we wanted to use projection in this case uh, was going to be a problem. Uh, but he was so excited about the possibility of creating this experience that, you know, he didn't even give a second thought to taking that out of the design. Um, and what was also extremely important was if you, if you took away the art, it was just a wall. Like afterwards, we ended up talking to the, to the real estate agent, which was also a, an interesting conversation. The real estate agent that was selling this home and was used to selling these really high-end homes. And she talked about, you know, how one of the things that she loved was not only that this was such a compelling piece as soon as you walked into the home, but also when it was not on, it just simply reverted to a wall and you could see the, the, the reflection of the pool outside, the sunlight, you could see it play on the wall uh, like a natural sundial, right? Which, 
depending on which technology you use is not possible. So everything was in function of the design. Everything was in function of the experience. Uh, and it, it just basically fitted neatly into the design and, and architecture of the home. So for the architect, uh, it, it was a prime example of this is not technology as a barrier. This is simply technology enabling something. I want to be uh, an important part of the design of my home. That's fantastic. Um, so two things that I would like to highlight there in, in a little bit more detail. The first thing is, again, most people do think of technology as a limitation. Well, we can't do that. We can't do this. We're going to have to change this. When we're working with Barco and we have you know a project together, right? Barco has, like you said, some of the best engineers in the world. So is it fair to say the architect, the interior designer, they, they can come and say, look, this is our vision. This is what we want to accomplish in this space. And then we bring Barco in, Barco's engineers work on that to serve the design and to serve the space. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And it's even become a design um, objective for us as well. So when we design our products, we take that perspective into account as well, architectural integration, right? Which you could translate as hide everything but the picture, right? Make it, uh, make it so that it's really easy to use the technology to achieve the design objectives. Uh, same thing with, with creating art, for example, which we can come back to a little bit later when we dive uh, a little bit deeper uh, into the art as aspect. But yeah, that's become really, uh, a really important, a really important driver for us. And the thing that I've also found is that it's been amazing to me when, when I've sometimes with a with an architect or a designer have gone in a conversation that started as I don't know who you are and what you do, that very quickly went, could we do this? Could we do that? So you know, obviously, since architecture and design is is, is a big interest of mine, I have my ideas as well of what you can do which is always a great starter for a conversation. But I've been amazed how natural this concept comes to architects and designers and how quickly they're miles ahead of me as to what kind of things they, they, can, create, uh, they can create around it. And then it's our job to create the tools to create as few limitations as possible uh, to, to the vision uh, of, of the artist and the designer. Interesting. So what is, so really what we're trying to do is excite the imagination, right? Give them, give, empower the designers and the architects to say, rethink what's possible, right? With technology, number one. Number two is when we think about what kind of experience are we trying to create in the home, right? So what, can you give me some examples, some more examples of what people who, for example, went into that home in Atlanta, what did they what did they feel what did they think what did they, what were they trying what were they experiencing what was that what was the impact of that digital canvas for them well i guess in in this case specifically the impact is is similar to to the impact of art in general right uh, you know especially art i think is a, is a brilliant example of, of of one of these experiences because by nature it's emotional to people Right, even though we dive into wellness applications specifically where you can create, you know, ocean views or, or things like that, art itself also plays a plays a role in it. So to me, it's all it's always about creating an emotional connection. And art creates an emotional connection. And of course, you know, different people react to react or interact with, with art in a different way. But it's just it was so unique that when you saw people walking in there, that they're, they're taken aback, right? And it's quite interesting because as, as you can see, the house was actually quite full of art. So you see on this other, actually this one, on this other wall, for example, there were more traditional uh, works of art. And, you know, people had, had paid quite a bit of attention to bringing art into that home, but there was nothing that had the same impact as this work of art. Of course, the fact that it was digital, the fact that it was moving art was special in itself, but just the sheer size of the work and how it was integrated in the home to a point where it was almost, well, it was part of the home, uh, made a huge made a huge impact. Uh, and the interesting thing for me was 
this was seeing people walk into the house completely unprepared, right? They weren't coming to look at digital art. They weren't coming to look at technology. They just walked into the home and experienced it. Um, and one of the things that struck me was when the real estate agent put it on the market and she did her, for, her first uh, Instagram post on it, literally the first thing she mentioned was imagine walking into your home and seeing this, uh, this amazing work of art, for example. But the technology is still relevant, right? Because in this case specifically, we could only have done this with projection because if you did this with a video wall, you could imagine the nightmare of having a huge black hole up there when the, the work of art is not being displayed. Um, so being able to take it away is, is also uh, a huge part of, of what you can do here. And I'll, sh I'll show you maybe uh, another example here in the same home, which was uh, in the living room. Right, where we simply took away, we simply took the whole wall and just a projection mapped the whole wall. And in that way, you created, you really created the sense that this is not a screen, which, you know, I, you'll hear Tim, me talk Tim, about. Tim, Tim, one sec. So just for everybody here, let's make sure we, we understand what we're talking about. What do you mean by projection mapping on a whole wall? Can you clarify that? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, when, when we call it mapping, it's because you literally map it on top of something, right? In this case, a wall. But projection mapping could also be, I mean, we, we've projection mapped the, the Sydney Opera House, right? Which is a more sophisticated uh, mapping, but it's really overlaying something. But I think what, what's really important to me is, is taking away that notion of screen just because when people see a screen and they see a 16 by nine aspect ratio, for example, your brain already creates a context, right? Your brain says, oh, this is a TV or it's a computer screen. So whatever I see on that, that's the context that I need to see it in, which is why when uh, we are talking about digital art specifically, I find a 16 by nine screen that is used so often for digital art these days, I find that it really devalues the art because it creates completely the wrong context. So unless you're in a gallery or unless you're in a museum, if you put a 16 by nine screen uh, in a home, and I mean, you can put the $70 million work of art on there that was recently, was recently sold, you know, someone will walk in and might mistake it for a, for a screensaver because it's on a TV, right? Uh, and that completely devalues the work of art. It completely devalues the artist. So maybe this is a good moment to dive into a little bit of the art. I know that in, an, in one of the next sessions, we're going to dive deeper into it. But when you look at it from the art, you know, technology companies go, I'm talking to an artist, I'm selling him a screen, right? It's like, actually, no, that, that's not what I'm doing. What am I offering the artist here? I'm offering him at least two things that are extremely important in, in, in my mind, particularly when we approach it in this way. One is quality. Right. Sometimes, and you know, I'm going to be a, a, a little disrespectful for a minute, but sometimes you see digital art on, on the screen where you go, well, actually, this is like this is like seeing a Picasso on toilet paper, right? It, it's just it, it's completely wrong. It's not right. You know, sometimes in home theater, as you know, we talk about as the director intended. Well, as the artist intended is, is nowhere more important than in this thing. So having the proper quality of digital canvas is incredibly important because it can make all the difference in texture. It can make all the difference in, in depth, which are creative issues. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is if you, know, if you look at digital art these days, you'll find that most works are in a 16 by nine aspect ratio. And if you're lucky, maybe it's in portrait. Why? Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. People go, well, these are the screens that I have available to me, so I have to create for the screen. How, how insane is that, right? Can you imagine that you said to Leonardo da Vinci, you can paint whatever you like. Uh, it's just, it has to be this shape and one of these three sizes, right? That you're killing the artist. So the second thing that we are offering the artist here is artistic freedom, right? You design the canvas. It can be whatever you want it to be. And even the artists themselves sometimes are, you know, are, are taken by these limitations that they sometimes grow to accept them. You know, we had, uh, we had a, a, a Davide Quiola, who's a really renowned, uh, fantastic artist in the, in the digital space. 
I invited him to our headquarters and we created using LED panels, we created a number of canvases uh, with different resolutions or different dot pitches. And he uh, brought some of his works to, to see what they looked like. And uh, he rendered it one-to-one -to, -one to make sure he had the best quality. And he also thought, well, I'm going to be looking at the highest resolution, right? But that's exactly what I wanted to prove was, no, resolution, when you talk about art, it's not about the resolution, it's what's the right texture you're looking for for your work of art. And he ended up choosing uh, a resolution that was far from the highest resolution, but it was the right texture for his work of art. Uh, and the fact, for example, that that specific technology was non-reflective created a different sense of depth. So, you know, one of the things that I want to do in the near, in the near future is together with Davide and, and, and some other people from the art world, write about uh, using technology as a material for the canvas and how different choices enable uh, the vision of the artist in, in different ways. But it all starts with the artist and the experience, not with the technology. That as you can so, see, I, is, I, I can get carried away about this stuff. No, so that's, please, that's please phenomenal. And I think that's fantastic, fantastic points there. And it's so refreshing to see a technology company actually approach things from the perspective of the artists, from the perspective of the creators, from the architects and the designers to say, what experience are you trying to create in this home, in this space? And then we will design around that with technology. It's, it's profoundly refreshing. You don't see that very often. And, and I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out for people in case they don't know is Barco, puts their money where their mouth is. I mean, you are in some of the best museums in the world and some of the best exhibits in the world showing digital art, correct? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it, it equally applies, of course, to, to museums or galleries or, or, or people's homes. Uh, you know, there's a couple of, there's a couple of examples. There's the, there's the Van Gogh exhibition, for example, in, uh, in France where we literally took a whole space and basically made the space, the canvas, right? Including the floor, the walls, everything became the canvas. Uh, there's, there's also um, a, a digital museum in New York, for example, where Rafik Anadol was one of the artists that created one of these experiences. And, and it's profoundly, um, profoundly impressive. Uh, and, and an emotional connection. You know, I've, I've been in there, I've, I've seen the effect on people. Uh, and, and to me, it, it, it all has to do with taking away that notion of screen, right? If you take away that notion of screen and you think of anything can become a canvas, like Rafik Anadol even put his work uh, onto the, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. Um, I, I don't know if you saw that one, but it's amazing. So it's really this idea that anything can be a canvas is very liberating. Uh, and the idea that you as an artist can say, hey, I don't need to conform to the technology. The, con the technology can conform to me. Um, that's what this is all about. Uh, and, you know, for me, it was the dots are out there, but nobody so far was really connecting them. Uh, so when we first went and talked to, to some gallery owners like uh, Pitforms in New York, for example, Steve Sachs is, is, is one of the people that, that we worked with and looked at, um, it made, made a lot of sense to him as well, uh, even to the point where he said, you know, can I, can I be a Barco residential integrator? Uh, I said, well, you could be, but it doesn't make sense, right? You're an art, you're an art person, let, let the integrators uh, help you because there is a need in this market for people that understand not only the technology, but also completely understand the artist, the art world and, and the whole context. Um, and then in art, of course, you, when you get to digital art, you also get into questions of how do you get the content, right? I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to go to Christie's and, and, and bid on a work of art, you know how that works, right? It needs to be authenticated. You need to pay for it. You, pay, you take possession. You have people that can hang it digital art, people don't quite know how that works, right? Uh, so that's where you now get uh, into discussions like non-fungible tokens, you know, the work of art that was sold for, for $70 million. Uh, you know, the NFTs uh, are, are, are like a, a Bitcoin for collectibles. So all of that stuff is coming together.
but someone needs to bring it together, right? The art world also needs a partner that understands this and is not hung up on the technology itself, but is an expert on using that technology in service of uh, the art world, because there's also other questions like, okay, what, what if my technology breaks, right? Can I replace it simply by other technology without affecting the, the integrity of, of the work of art? Uh, you know, that's why we work with companies like NEO uh, together to, to also um, have solid ways of bringing uh, the art itself to people, right? Because uh, it's, it's a different proposition. Um, but I think all of these things are, are, are coming together now. And, and that's also what I see as, as part of our role and, and part of our ecosystem's role is, is to enable that in function of the artist. And the thing is, I started thinking about this, like if I were, if I were an artist, how would I think about this, right? That's where I, it kind of dawned on me that, well, artistic freedom is probably the highest good and the highest value to any artist. Uh, so that's really what it's about. And so one of the scariest moments, uh, even after I had been arrogant enough to give some presentations on this was when I was in Rafik Anadol's studio and I said, you know, would you mind if I kind of share the story that I'm telling with you, actually make sure that it, it, it makes sense to you like it makes sense to me. Uh, and, and fortunately, you know, he completely agreed with, um, with what I was saying. Otherwise I would have had to uh, <laughs> revise a couple of things and, and, and take a, a, a walk of shame in a way. Um, but it was really fantastic to, you know, to be able to talk to, to the artists. And, you know, it, it is one thing about technology companies is, you know, no matter how much we talk about, we need to look at the needs of the customer it's surprising how few of us actually, you know, go out and, and talk to an artist, for example, and, and, and try to be in their shoes and see how we can, how we can make it all work together. And, you know, like I said, it's, in a sense, it's no different than the Middle Ages, right? Uh, I'm sure that Leonardo da Vinci didn't just trust anyone to make, you know, to make a canvas to, for his paintings. That's interesting. So it sounds like there's a lot of momentum that's being built and you mentioned that nobody's really connecting the dots and that's partly why we're here today so what what do you think the not only what is the impact that you would like to have on the art world moving forward the digital art world but how can we help you know think that through and and make those make more of those connections so that it does have more of an impact because i think it's just I haven't experienced it yet in person, hopefully soon, but I think it is so unique to walk into a home and see a 30 foot piece of digital art on a wall that was designed for that wall by a specific artist. I think that's incredible. And we don't have enough of those experiences uh, you know, in, in our lives right now. So what can we do? How can we start to think about and, and evolve this, this digital canvas to build more momentum? Well, I, I think one of the things is, is doing what we do today, right? Uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's about inspiring people. So the, the thing that I'm looking for as well is that, you know, anytime I've spoken with an architect or a designer or been involved with an artist or a gallery, it has always made sense. Um, but of course, how do you scale that? Right, we need we need these stories to to go uh, in front of many more people than than are there today. So, you know, it's making sure that we, uh, I guess, get a bit of a get a bit of a movement started and get more people involved. And and as we do more of these projects, we need to use them to inspire people. You know, the way I think of it is a little bit like the, the way I see a publication like Architectural Digest. Uh, right, you look at Architectural Digest and. You know, the way I look at that, I love, I love reading, you know, I love viewing the, the pictures of, of, of a home that was created. I love reading about, uh, you know, how the architect and designer came to the concept. I love reading about what kind of people they were uh, and why the design is like that. And, you know, this whole creative process that, that, uh, that happens. Um, the reality of the matter is if, if our industry was, was publishing Architectural Digest, it would be a magazine about the, the technical properties of bricks. 
uh, right? And now the thing is, those technical properties of, of bricks are important when you create these things, right? And, you know, any architect and designer will tell you that a lot of their education is learning about materials and how they can use those materials to, to realize their designs. You know, why do I use concrete? You know, how do I use this type of wood? Uh, so in this sense, it, it's not that, it's not different. It's no different, right? It's just in a, in a digital world. And once you make that connection, um, it really makes sense to, ar to architects and designers. And, and for us as an industry, what it takes is for integrators to understand this and, and to say, yeah, we want to invest in this, right? We, we know that uh, maybe we need, we need different, uh, different kinds of people on our staff, right? Uh, it also goes back to things like experience centers. You know, there's, there's always a lot of discussion about should I have an experience center in our industry or should I not have an experience center? It's, you know, it's my conviction that you sell an experience with an experience, right? And, and if it's not an experience, then it's not, it's not emotional, right? And if, you know, these are the kind of things where people engage with here, right? Not, not here. Uh, and, and that's a huge difference. You know, sometimes we, we get so hung up on the technology to the point uh, where we say, oh my God, listen, listen to these speakers, for example. You know, I'm going to play this song and, and the speakers sound fantastic, or this song sounds fantastic on those speakers. Yeah, you know what? If I don't like the song, you can play it all night long, right? I'm going to think up here, and I'm going to think that's an expensive pair of speakers. I don't think I'm going to do that. But if you play my favorite song in the world, like I've never heard it before, that decision is taken here, right? And then the only thing I'm thinking about is I want that experience right? That experience is life for me. And then quite often the discussion is just, can I afford it or not? Right? It's, uh, I, I, I actually tried this out on my, on my wife as well. You know, I like to experiment on my family. So it's, it's a good thing I didn't go into the medical profession. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I took my wife to, to, to World of Macintosh in New York. Um, you know, I told the guys, just give her the experience, have her sit down, um, and my wife to me is always, you know, she brings me back down to earth and it's like, yeah, it's nice, but come on, uh, you know, that's, that, that's a crazy investment, uh, you know, surely you can, you can do with a $500 pair of speakers, for example, but I told them, do play this song, right, a song that, that I knew she loved, uh, you know, she sat in this fantastic environment, she listened to it, um, and then she turns to me and, and I, was, I was bracing for what she was going to say, right? Because I was half thinking, I'm going to have to retire all my theories after this. Uh, and the only thing she said was, can we afford this? And so my answer naturally was, no, <laughs> right? Uh, but then her next question to me was the $100 million question, because you know it's easy to create a unique experience for the richest guy in the world right? We're going to be doing that once and that's it. But her next question was, how close can we get? And that to me is the million dollar question, right? Not can you afford this or can you afford that? It's basically, is this an experience that moves me to the point where I want to have it as part of my life? Uh, and then, you know, then you can make the choices as well, right? Uh, it was very eye-opening for me to speak to the real estate agent as well because all she had experienced was the work of art. There had been no discussion of the technology, how do we do this, nothing. All she saw was the end result. So when she asked me afterwards, now, you know, what does it cost to, to do something like this in a home? Uh, I, I gave her a number uh, that I was slightly fearful that, you know, she, she was going to fall over. Uh, and all she said was, huh, yeah, that's, that makes perfect sense, you know, for this type of what home. Was the what, was the no what was no the number? No, I told her, I told her, look, in this case specifically, it could be $150,000 to $200,000, right? And her answer was, oh, well, any home of $5 million or over, this is an absolute no-brainer. She said, anything below that, maybe you're competing with the swimming pool or maybe you're competing with a Ferrari or, or, or something like that. But to me, 
that was the key point because the thing is when when people make designs or they have a home design we all have to make trade-offs right so you make your trade-offs according to what you find valuable but the thing is when people are making these trade-offs we're not even there right most people don't realize uh, i can have this kind of experience in my home because if they do chances are that they say you know what i prefer this this work of art to, to that retaining wall. Maybe a retaining wall is a bad is a bad example because that might be structural, but uh, you, 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 you know what I mean, right? Yeah. So, you know, we need to be part of, of the creative process of designing a home. Um, and art to me was, was a great example also because the, there's also a very natural connection between the art world and the architectural and design world, for example. So it all really, it all really neatly falls um, falls into place, and you know, let's let's face it, some of these works are are amazing. You know, we we, we did one at a major trade show a couple of years ago, and, and the guy that actually managed the trade show, uh, you know, he was used to seeing video walls that were ten times as as large with all kinds of colorful content and and, and everything else, um, and uh, you know. At the end of one of the days, I was standing myself in front of this work of art by Rafik Anadol and just taking it in, right? Because as a human, um, and I felt a presence next to me and I saw this guy who basically ran the whole show and this is a major technology show. And he said, I've been, I've been waiting to come in here all day. This is amazing, right? It wasn't the latest LED panel that I was using. It wasn't the highest resolution LED panel that I was using, but what we were doing with the art had way more impact on him than all the technology on the show floor combined. And that's that's what this is about, right? This, this is something where, I mean, we should all be so lucky to be surrounded by art. Absolutely agree. Can, so before we open up to questions, I want to just give a small preview of what we're going to be talking about on the next webinar, where we're going to be diving deeper into digital art, into how we're getting that digital art into people's homes. Can you talk a little bit, Bim, about, about that, about Neo, about um, what's going on in the art world and how we're trying to, to bridge that gap? Yeah, people. absolutely, and 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 we've talked we've talked a little bit about it uh, about it already, right? Um, but so the idea, the, the main idea of today was, you know, the digital canvas is almost like the foundation, right? Then how you use that digital canvas to create different experiences. Um, art is an important one. Uh, another one that that we can go into into the future is, for example, how do you use this for for wellness, for example, or even for gaming? You know, people talk about VR headsets, uh, but just imagine if I go back to this, um, if I go back to this other uh, picture for a second here, uh, where do I have it? Do you have the one that you did with uh, Art Basel? I thought that one was really interesting too. Yeah, there's different ones, but what you see behind me here, for example, is also a complete wall, right? Uh, it, it didn't feel like a screen. In fact, this is one of my favorite pictures because if you look there you see two little kids, right? Mm -hmm. These kids were so excited, they were actually almost running into the wall because they, they felt like this was really a frozen over lake uh, and they could, they could go at it. Uh, no kids were injured in, in the taking of this photograph, but the, this was all very natural. So this was just a natural reaction. These were just people on the show floor. Uh, I wanted to kind of recreate this and, and put the little kids into, into hockey gear. Right, so that it looked like they wanted to play hockey on the on 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 the um, on, on the space. But so imagine if you just take this and you put you put a game in it, for example, you make it life size, and it really feels like you've pushed over the wall into another reality. Uh, to me, that's 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 much better than a VR headset at this point in time. Also, because you can share it with other people in the same in the same space. Um, so that there's a lot of amazing uh, there's a lot of amazing opportunities that you have here. Um, but when we talk about the art one, for example, we will go into more detail how, how all the different dots fit together, right? Uh, working with Neo, for example, how it works from the perspective of getting the art content, how do you buy the art, 
uh, how does it work, for example, with curated selections of, of artworks that, that you can have on a rotating basis? There's, there's different ways there. Uh, what does it mean when we say artistic freedom, right? How do we create these canvases that, that uh, don't limit the artistic freedom of someone? Uh, what difference do the different technologies make, right? What, when would you use projection as a, as a base technology? When would you use LED panels as a base technology? Uh, but at that point in time, it's almost like it's almost like a cooking class, right? If you will. Uh, I mean, when you go to a, when you go to a high-end restaurant, for example, you don't start talking to the chef about you know how much am I paying for the Parmesan cheese, uh, and and why did you use this instead of in, instead of that? No, you know, uh, probably the, the the chef will run you out of the restaurant if you do that. Uh, you know, we don't have that we don't have that luxury, of course. But but it's not it's no different, right? So you know we can go deeper into now. How do you use these different ingredients, and and what choices do you make in function of the artist? Uh, like if if you look at uh, what we showed earlier, the, the giant projection, and then having the sundial, you could have only done that with projection, right? But there are other examples of where um, LED is absolutely the right choice to create a canvas, and I'll I'll show you uh, another. A uh, quick example here. I don't know how well you can see it, but behind me, this is also a real house where you see that uh, an art canvas was integrated into that piece of furniture that you see that you see uh, behind me there, for example. So when you see that, that is a that is a custom um, LED canvas. You can see that is not sixteen by nine or anything like that. Uh, it, it's completely as if it could be uh, as if it could be a painting. Um, also, that technology, depending on the dot pitch that you use, for example, you you will get different depth. You know, I, I I've seen someone uh, when we did one of these, I've seen someone walk up to it and try and reach his hand into it because he thought it was three D. Uh, you know, because of the the effect of the of the dot pitch, the effect of the fact that uh, you know you can put light onto an LED panel and it's non reflective. All of those things are important. You know, I saw the same work by Rafik Anadol uh, placed on what they called an art TV, which to me is like, it's like putting lipstick on a pig, you know, it's still a TV. Uh, but the fact that it was reflective took away all of the depth. Now you can imagine the impact on the artwork itself, the impact on the impact, if you will. Absolutely. No, and that's that's totally true. There's a lot of natural light in that room and having something that's non-reflective, it's going to look like a piece of art on the wall. It's not going to look like like a television. And well, and, and, and in that case in time, you know, you, you can even use the technology so that the technology always uh, could automatically adapt to the environmental light so that the work of art always looks the same. Uh, no matter how the environmental light evolves. Uh, one of the things we discovered when we did this with Davide Coyola, for example, was at some point in time, we reduced the, the light intensity of the LED panel. It kind of goes into a, it kind of goes into a power saving mode. But as we were there, when it happened, the effect was, huh, this is interesting. It now looks like a regular painting. It doesn't look digital anymore. So you could play with the light intensity there and actually make it look like a like a normal painting. Uh, with LED, for example, you could you can imagine that you can light the work of art in the way you would light a traditional painting. So that aspect can come back into it as well. So uh, there's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities there and, and a lot of things to to further explore and, and further develop. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tim. That was that was eye opening and enlightening, and I really appreciate it. I would like to open it up for the next, you know, eight to ten minutes or so for questions. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, sorry, more, more more than a question. Just to um, back up what Tim was saying, uh, I was present uh, at that uh, event that Tim was talking about when he was uh, deep into the Tim. Please don't take offense. Uh, uh, but the, there was one of my customer I took to show LED uh, pitch and the screen and the amount of heat it generates or less amount of heat it generates from traditional LED walls. And uh, 
we went in, we were looking at the screen and we, he said, okay, so what is this pitch? And Tim was standing there and Tim turned around and he said, the pitch is not important on this is what's on the screen that's important. Now this is linked to, can be linked to a windmill on top of New York building and the wind of spe speed of wind and speed of um, direction of wind changes that art like life that's more important. And I was in awe that I need to sell these, Tim, what are you doing? Uh, I need to sell these. Uh, it's, you're completely doing it wrong, but pulled him up, uh, up in the evening and um, he gave me a great example and I never forgot, and I think I'm successful, my bosses might think I'm wrong, uh, which was that I, as a cinema dealer or a cinema distributor, need to be a sofa salesman. If you walk into a sofa showroom, a salesman come in and he says, oh, these springs and this sofa are made out of stainless steel and the wood is cedar wood, nobody cares. If I like, visually like something, I'll sit on it. If I like it, I'll sit on it, then I'll call the sales guy, then I will make, make the deal. And I, and I took that on board, it was three years ago, Tim. Oh, well, yeah, it was exactly three years ago in February the 8th, I think, uh, that exhibition. And I took that on board and I use that in my every single day life. And, and, and the art wise, uh, of course, um, but how passionate Tim is about the digital art and how to deliver that is, is completely unique. It's not about selling a product. It's about delivering the art in the best possible way. Uh, I think technology, just conversation of technology with architects and the designers completely falls away. The cost doesn't really matter at that time. So uh, apologies, Tim, please don't take offense, but I no, thought it was, it was quite funny that uh, we, we were talking about the same exhibition and I, I was, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was nice. So reminiscing, sorry. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Jay. That's, uh, I, I agree. I agree hundred percent. I got into this business because I heard for the first time when I was 16, I love classical music. I love music in general. And I heard for the first time in my life, a pair of speakers that they don't make anymore. They don't exist anymore. I couldn't afford them, but the performers were in the room with me when I closed my eyes. And I, I said, I want to live that experience again. I want to be able to recreate that memory. Or if I go to a beautiful show and, and, I, and I buy it on disc later, I want to be able to create that experience again and again and again, where I, you know, in my, in my life, so that I can be nourished by that. So I, I totally, I agree 100%. Um, I have a comment. Um, first, I, oops. First, uh, I think this is fascinating, um, mainly because um, for some people might be new, but ultimately it's not so new uh you know david hockney made uh digital paintings the only difference is that he printed on a canvas uh there are a lot of artists already doing it uh, but they don't have as you said team they don't have the means uh to move from a canvas to a different platform actually that painting that uh art <laughs> behind me it's a digital uh uh work it doesn't move, but it is a uh, digital art uh, and it's not site specific, but this specific artist, she only does digital work. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a lot of art artists looking for that opportunity, uh, not only artists who come from a technology background. I think today the, uh, the design, the technology is included in the creative industry, which is something that we, um, thanks to uh, the UK, of course, who had a huge influence on those studies because if it's made by an artist is art, period. That's mainly the definition of art. Uh, I, I did uh, go to the, uh, um, a Lumiere in Paris. It was the uh, uh, Clint exhibition. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. 
it was fascinating. I would definitely have my entire home uh, surrounded by uh, Clint or whatever it is. I did see the the Van Gogh also in Estonia, but it was not a uh, it was like a 360 experience, which mm -hmm. was already uh, incredible. And also we have the Artec House now yes. uh, in Miami, in New York, in uh, now in I think DC, mm -hmm. and they. Uh, they have a successful model because they hire artists, they commission artists to make each projection. And I think that's mm -hmm. an amazing recipe. Uh, there is also a, a billboard in uh, at Times Square uh, that they call public art. They call public digital art. And mm -hmm. one of the billboards is a, a public art call, call for artists. And they commission the artist to project something, to plan something. And of course, who doesn't go to Times Square and get absolutely fascinated about all of those digital art? That's art. Mm -hmm. So I think this is all fascinating. I think there is a lot of potential, you know, here in Boston, you know, Gustavo, you know, MIT is all about digital art and, and making it available. And what you said, Tim, you want the artist to be included in the architecture process of building a home. I mean, we want the artists to be involved in every sector of mm -hmm. urban planning, health. You know, why can't we have uh, cat skins, machines built by artists and being a monument? So I think this is fantastic. I think the artists are definitely open for uh, that new digital experience. I don't think they have the means. Also because the, um, the traditional art school still does not include digital art mm. as a, uh, a, a subject, you know, other than RISD here in New England, they do have design and now other uh, slowly uh, the academic world is recognizing how important it is to include that in the curriculum. I think that would be a good partnership to partner with the academia and uh, make, make them understand that this is a business a path for the artist. It's another opportunity for the artist to make a living of making art. Uh, I don't think uh, galleries are going to be a challenge for you or art fairs. I think you are in good hands with art fairs. They are thirsty for uh, for uh, creativity from uh, that scope. So I think this is fascinating. Congratulations. It's great. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, that's that's very insightful, Claudia. Thank you. That's uh, it's it's great to see that there's that much potential there in in the art world for embracing this and creating these experiences in more more homes and more places. Anybody else? Any questions? Any comments? Barry, your microphone is muted, but please, please. Yeah, no problem. I, I, can you hear me now? I'm very sorry. I, the technology still eludes me. Just ask Adam and Faye, they'll tell you. Um, I just was curious to know how essential is it, Tim, for this to be put in a new building or can the technology be, be somehow repurposed so that a building that is already in place can take advantage of this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, especially because I guess my point is if you have a wall, you have a potential for a digital canvas, right? And, and, and everybody has a wall. Um, so absolutely, because even one of the things, like you look at places like New York, people, people tend to think that they need a lot of space, right? But with, with modern technology, you don't really. Uh, of course, you need, the, you need the space for the canvas itself. But in terms of uh, how the technology can be integrated, there's so many possibilities today um, that there's really very few limitations. Like if you look at the, the word that you saw before, and let me maybe uh, bring it up, bring it up again. But if you look at the one behind me, for example, which in this case has a, uh, has a different work of art on it, um, if you 
turn this picture around, for example, you wouldn't be able to find the technology. Uh, no. You know, the projector actually sits behind the wall on top of a, on top of a laundry, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so that's part of what we try and enable with the technology as well, is to really remove uh, as many uh, limitations as possible. Uh, and like, you know, this could mean putting the technology in the ceiling, in the wall, uh, you know, putting it very close, putting it off axis. So, you know, the traditional idea of what a projector is, for example, where people think, okay, there's going to be a big thing hanging in my living room and it has to be in the middle of the screen, for example, is, is no longer the case. Um, not to say that there are no, no limitations, right? You know, depending on the, on the situation, there might always be limitations. Um, but these days, there's, there's very few of them. So I would say if you have a wall, you can have a digital canvas. Well, to that point, then, I'm just wondering about the idea of perhaps having some of the selling aspect of this or the marketing aspect of it be the ability to rotate the images or change them from time to time. Uh, because it seems to me that I, I'm thinking of a number of its situations where I was not only in rooms that had huge, larger than life murals in them, but that were stationary. But the idea of having someone be able to come in and I don't know with the pressing of a button actually change that image uh, or maybe even tailor uh, the technology and the space in which it's housed to particular taste of individuals could ultimately prove also a selling point. The, Absolutely. the other thing that occurs to me too is just from the standpoint of performance and scenic design, there are so many instances in in decades gone by where uh theaters with smaller budgets would just take a projection screen and then take a slide and put it up there so as to suggest a forest or a ballroom or something like that to give a certain amount of ambiance to the music that was being performed but it just occurs to me that this creates so many more options for um for theaters and for auditoriums, would it be then difficult to use this technology in a, say like a place like the Metropolitan Opera House where there, there is already so much technology, but not quite like this, how difficult would it be to install something like this? From a, from a technology perspective, not, not that difficult. I mean, cost, I cost, cost, cost is always a factor, right? Of course, uh, yeah. But if we leave that out, out of the picture, there's, there's very few limitations. Um, and, and what you hit on before is, is absolutely correct. On the one hand, even if you look at it purely as, as art, there's the opportunity to change the art. So that's where um, Neo, for example, already provides today's more, more kind of subscription rather than owning the art, where, for yeah. example, they will have a collection. Let's say this could be a collection uh, by the curator of, a, of, of an art museum. And then, you know, you can get this rotating collection in your home. That, that is one opportunity. Uh, but also going further than that, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to, be, have to be art. Now, of course, I'm being very conscious of the context, right? If you, if you use this in the wrong way, you can devalue a lot of things. But sure. if you think about the one behind me, for example, if you take, if you switch it off, then it could just be the light playing on the wall as if nothing was ever there. But you could also equally, for example, replace that by a forest view, right? Which could even be a live feed of the forest that is actually behind the, behind the house itself, right? Um, yeah. an another thing that I'm thinking of, and again, this, is, this then relates back to things like wellness and, and also emotional connect connection. Uh, you know, imagine a place like Manhattan where you have all these really expensive condos, for example, that don't have a lot of space, uh, but they do have a wall, right? Uh, imagine if I then turn that wall into this canvas, not only where you can enjoy art, but, you know, maybe you have a house in the Hamptons with an ocean view that you love, and I can actually put that live ocean view in your condo in Manhattan, right? Imagine, imagine the impact of that. So, you know, the other thing that is so amazing about it is, is it gives you all these different possibilities. And, and that's why, you know, no matter how much I like uh, 
you know, the canvases that you can create in, in odd shapes and forms. I really, really love the idea of projecting onto a whole wall so that it just feels like you've pushed it over, right? And it, yeah, and it, exactly. And, and it's almost a portal into another dimension. And, and from there, it's limitless. It could be gaming, right? It could be a gaming world. It could be a live concert that is being streamed. It's, it's mind blowing. It also occurs to me just as you're talking that it would give great value to um, auctions at, at houses like Sotheby's and Christie's, for example, if the objects are that are the items that are part of different lots could be uh, put onto a screen like this, because it gives so often a lot of details uh, get missed because the technology doesn't allow you to see certain subtleties and refinements. Like if there's a line drawing, for example, that uh, you know, you're depending on basically a very uh, poorly detailed image that does not let you see so many of the things that you want to examine as you're seeking to buy a piece. And to have these put into auction houses like a, you know, like a, a, a Bonhams or something like that would be of great value to people who go to these sort of digitally and all over the world just to see more of the detail. The other dimension, too, is that the possibilities for artists designing images or designing works that are specifically meant to include this technology means that there's going to be a real expansion and a moving forward of art itself in the same way that, you know, that when 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 opera first got done and there's a story of Handel going in to see a, a rehearsal and water was designed to be held behind two sheets of glass so as to make it look like a flood. Well, it was so realistic that he ran from the auditorium thinking something had gone very wrong as they began to let the water flow out. So what I'm suggesting too is that there would be innovations that and initiatives that could include this technology in the same way that there had when they had started coming out with single haired paint brushes that gave technique uh, for artists a greater ability to do things that they simply couldn't do before so it sounds to me as though you have an extraordinary range of very practical applications and not just for people who are gallerists but even for performances and uh, other industries where we want precision and also a kind of visual intimacy with a work simply because we need to have that in order to better examine it and better understand it. And if it's easier to sort of incorporate this technology, it seems to me that you've got a limitless number of applications for which you can use this technology. It's very exciting. No, absolutely. And, and Barry, you're the perfect example of what I was saying before, right? Once, once the concept of digital canvas makes sense, the sky's the limit. Right. Yep. And, and the thing is, I, I, I have my ideas, but they've, they've always only been seeding other people's ideas. You know, another thing that we did uh, a little while ago was take part in a design competition where Hilton invited some of the top design firms and hospitality design firms in the country and said, you know, design your concept for the luxury hotel room of the future. Right. Wow. And uh, we, we were there. And, uh, you know, people were there that had fabrics and furniture and all that kind of stuff. And all the designers and architects were talking to all those people because they knew who they were and it made sense. Nobody was talking to me because they didn't know who I was, nor did it make sense why I was there. Uh, so at the end of the afternoon, they finally came to me because they had to, because I was a sponsor. Um, and that had given me the time to say, OK, you know what, I'm going to pretend I'm also a design firm and I'm going to make my own design for this hotel room. So when they finally came to me, I just shared, you know, I explained to them the same thing that we did today. Just look at it as a digital canvas. Here's some ideas of what we could do in this hotel room. And before I knew it, they were, and they were kilometers ahead. And less than 24 hours later, the, the, the winning design had three projection systems in it, sure. right? None of these designers, if I would have told them you're going to have three projectors in your hotel room uh, the morning of, of, of the competition, they would have said you're out of your mind, right? The next day they were in there simply because I had opened their mind to a tool that they had. And they, yeah, it, you know, they came up with all these ideas of, of what they could do with it. It was, 
it was exhilarating. I can only imagine. I just want to say just just one of the things that occurs to me, as you mentioned hotels, there is a hotel in Berlin that I like staying at when I'm there. And they have they have huge walls in all of the rooms and down the hallways where they have taken these larger than life murals and projected them so that, behind, you know, one wall, which may be, say, 18 feet by 10 feet, has a mural that is basically a, uh, an extract from a painting. But of course, it's stagnant because they've had these images enlarged and put into the room and just installed kind of like wallpaper or something. It would be wonderful, I would think, to your point about hotels, to be able to change this, to be able to sort of press a button and then come in and have a different image every day, or to even use that as a means by which to find out the art, the favorite art of people who are coming in as clients of the hotel and have that there too, to just basically have the ability to choose your own art to so be surrounded by that during your hotel stay. So I would think that all of these things could be things that could uh, would be very Absolutely. beneficial. That not to mention, and not just art, but I'm thinking photographs and even just, you know, just, just images across the board. There's so many practical Absolutely. applications that could really be in, in, entice people. I'm sorry, Faye, I do this all the time in our meetings, Tim, I cut everybody. No, no, not so at please all. Go I, ahead. I, I really love listening to all of this. Gustavo and I do have to run to another meeting, but I don't want, I, I think this relationship is so important for anybody else who's watching, listening, feel free to reach out to us, you know, Gustavo, myself, Tim, we can certainly continue the conversation. Don't have to cut it short. 